We're going we're to be back in, in Three Kings. We've been looking at a character study from the Bible and the lives of Saul and David and Solomon. And what we learn is that the only thing that changes with people are the styles of clothing. But the human heart is the same. And we have the same issues today that we will wrestle with that people who have gone before us are, go are going to deal with. Some of you um, like to play games, uh, whether they're board games or strategy games. And, and some of you are really good at the game of chess. I, I'm not very good at the game of chess. I, there's all these pieces, and there's so many rules. Like, but yet you, you notice, and even if you're not very good at that game, the, the pieces in the front, they're pawns, right? They're the, these weak little pieces. They can only move one space at a time and can only attack diagonally. And they're, they're, not, they're not very significant. Nothing like you know a queen or a rook, which are, are powerful pieces. Yeah, but, but the thing, but the thing with the, the pawn that's really really interesting, oh, sorry, these are fixed. How am I supposed to, how am I, I'm just moving this. See, we get new stuff, and the pastor tries to break it the first Sunday. Uh, but the pawn, when it goes across the board, can be exchanged for a more powerful piece or become a more powerful piece. Now, you wouldn't make it a king because a king is really the weakest piece of all on, on a game of chess, but it can become like another queen. It can become another piece on the board. And what we're going to see today is how, how an unlikely person, a shepherd, becomes the most powerful person in the kingdom. And this is a man by the name of David. He starts off as someone who is insignificant, if not in his own eyes and definitely in his family's eyes. But what we're going to see is that God uses unlikely people. God uses insignificant people. God uses people that others don't think have enough talent, have enough charisma, have enough brain power, and God will use them for his glory. And we see that all through Scripture. Amos was a shepherd. He wasn't a prophet or the son of a prophet by his own words. But God called him to preach boldly to bring the nation back, to reform them so that they might listen. We see Paul, who was formerly known as Saul, not Saul the king, was a persecutor of Christians. I mean, you can't get much more unlikely than that. See, somebody who kills Christians for a hobby will now become the evangelist for the church. But God can come and take somebody who's insignificant in terms of their ability or position and raise them up so that he will receive the glory. Or he can take somebody whose heart is far from him and so transform it so that they are indeed a completely different person. And some of you have lived those lives where you say, Pastor, you would not believe who I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 3 years ago. Because God is about changing people for his glory. And it is about his glory. So, so many times when I was younger, maybe you did this. Maybe you still do this. Man, if that person got saved, they could do great things for God. God doesn't need people to do great things for him. Rather, he does great things through his people. And that's the amazing thing. Is if his, if our, his people will humble themselves before him and submit themselves to his hand and be courageous enough to do what he says, God can do almighty things through very insignificant people. And David is one of these people. Oh, David has great talent. No, make no mistake. David has great talent. God-given talent. But it would have been missed. He would have spent his days laboring in a sheep pasture. The youngest son in a large family. One who even his own father didn't think was significant enough to bring to the feast when the prophet came to town. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. So please join me in prayer and we're going to look at a man named David. God, we come before you this morning and I, and I do pray that that we would come before you and that you would speak to us this morning and that we would understand that you are a God who does mighty things. That you don't need us, but we desperately need you. And, and with that, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that we might see where you would lead us and what you would have us to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So, Saul was the king. Saul is still the king. But God has rejected Saul. This was our previous sermon when I was preaching, so two weeks ago. God has rejected Saul because he was not a man who would obey. He was a not a man who had God's own heart. And God wanted him for his king, for his people, and the chosen nation of Israel. He wanted somebody to have his heart before the people. But Saul disobeyed. At least a couple times, very substantially, where Samuel, the prophet, speaking for God, said, the nation has been torn for you and will be given to another man who is your better. Not exactly what a king likes to hear. And we read in, in the Bible, in 1 Samuel, that Samuel grieved. Samuel wasn't holier than thou and happy that Saul had failed, but he loved Saul. Saul, after all, had been the people's choice. He was tall. He was handsome. He had won some military victories. So from the outward appearance, and probably even his personality, he was probably very likable. And Samuel wanted Saul to succeed, but Saul failed because he would not heed the words of the Lord. He kind of wanted to amend them. Some of you have children. Um, Tibbs and I were... Tibbs is in children's church, but we were talking about how our children, we, we, we give them an instruction and say, this is what you're to, supposed to do, and they immediately, maybe we're both trying to raise lawyers, but I think this is all children. Well, how about we do this instead? They keep trying to amend the decree from the parental authority. Now, I need you to go and put this here. How about, I do, how about you just listen, right? And I remember my dad saying that to me as well. That, yes, there is a, there is a time for good discussion. And there's a time where you're just supposed to do what you're told. But Saul could not do what he was told. He wanted it up, to be up for debate, up for discussion, up for reinterpretation. But God's word stands firm. And when he disobeyed God's word, he was removed from kingship. Now he was removed in terms of God's sovereign plan before he was actually physically removed. But the decree has been given. And what God has decreed will come to pass. Well, Samuel's not feeling so good about this. He didn't see Saul ever again after he decreed that. In chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing as I have rejected him for reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Now Samuel, he's human, like us. He's like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Actually, what it says in the Bible says, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. So Samuel himself has some imperfections. He has some insecurities. He's like, Okay, wait a minute. You may be the one who establishes kings, but if the previous king isn't on board, he can still take my head and put it up as like an ornament on the mantle. So God, the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come with a sacrifice to the Lord. Then Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? They don't want trouble on their village. They don't really want a king from their village because some kings wipe out entire villages. We see this um, in, in history. Um, Stalin, not the most gentle of rulers, or decent of human beings, as we all know from history, if you've studied that part of history, um, instead of lifting up at the hometown where he came from, exterminated the hometown he came from, so no one could tell any stories from when he was young. Herod, in the Bible, we read in, in the Gospels, he killed all of the infants in the town of Bethlehem later on. Why? Because he heard a king was born. And so you can understand why the, the elders are a little bit nervous. It's like, Please don't anoint a king. Please don't anoint a king. Do it somewhere else. Do it over there. We'd love to have a king, but we'd also love to be alive. But he says, I come peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, that's the oldest, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. You can imagine Samuel. I'm going to Bethlehem, which is pretty much out in the sticks. Jerusalem's the city. Actually, hasn't been subjugated this time. Jerusalem's a city, and Bethlehem is its not a suburb. 
because there's valleys and hills, and at the time they didn't run together. But it's like, Bethlehem, really? It's just a tiny little scrub town. It's not notable. But finally, Eliab comes forward, and he's like, whoa. Okay, they've got some good strapping farm kids out here. He's tall. He's strong. He looks like a leader. I see why God sent me here. And so he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you get nothing else out of this sermon this morning? Please understand that God does not see as we see. It's God who searches the hearts and judges the motives. It's God who knows who we really are. At our worst moments, at our moments that we, we only share with ourselves, the places we won't let anyone else in, God sees our hearts. Now the good news is he died for all of our sins and he accepts us anyway. He doesn't accept us in terms of condoning who we, what we are, but in order to transform who we are at the core of our being, to transform us into his image. He loved us when we were sinners and loves us enough to make us something holy. But God sees to the core of this person and says, Eliab's not the guy. His heart is not sold out for me. You've had a king who wasn't sold out. We need a sold out king. And so it, so it continues. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass from before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then the, Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord pass, chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And, Je and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, there remains the youngest. And he, there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Now, they've been waiting a while. These guys have been walking fast. I'm sure the elders of the town are a little bit motivated because they're hungry. So they go out, they get David. But consider this for a moment. Jesse has a sacrifice. The prophet, the notable spiritual man is there. And David isn't important enough to invite. Isn't that, isn't that just kind of a curious saying? We think of David as this great hero of the faith, but right now, well, David just keeps the sheep. He's not really that important. Abinadab, he's important. Shema, he's important. Eliab, well, he's, he's handsome and tall. David, really? And so they sent and they brought him. Now he's ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And from that day forward, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So you see, Samuel comes. He per brings the other brothers. And, and you can see how God is showing. First he brings by the tall, the accomplished, the handsome, the strong, the ones that other people would esteem, before the elders, before Jesse even, and even before Samuel, so that he can see these guys all look the part, but I can see what's on the inside. And this young man has a heart towards me. We call David a man after God's own heart because that's what the scripture calls him. He says, his heart is sensitive to me. And we're going to go through David on four sermons. We're not covering it all today. And four sermons is not nearly enough. And we're going to see David does some horrific mistakes. But at the end, he has a heart that yearns for God. His, his victories are great. His mistakes are even bigger in some ways. But he per loves God. He wants to please God. He wants to seek God with his entire being and doesn't want to hold back. And God says, this is the man I want to rule over my people. A man who seeks after me. It's a, it was God's choice. Saul was the people's choice. This was God's choice. So what happens? David begins to prepare to be king. He's not ready to be king yet. One, he's a boy. Two, there's already a king. And three, this is kind of on the down low. 
But God has anointed him on the future king. So how is he prepared? Well, we've already alluded to this two weeks ago, but Saul is being vexed by a, a spirit of distress and anxiety. And he says, I need a musician. So apparently, well, David's hanging out in the sheep pasture because the sheep aren't very good conversationalists. He pulls out his, his instruments and he's learning how to play the stringed instruments. And we know later on he's a very accomplished musician. He writes a huge chunk of the Psalms. Most notably, the Lord is my shepherd, which I'm sure he got the idea from watching his sheep, being divinely inspired to put that imagery in that psalm. And so he's out, he becomes a musician in the court. And you say, I, I don't understand why that's so important. I mean, it shows he's musical. Well, how is a shepherd supposed to learn how to be a king? He's not going to formal etiquette school. He doesn't know how to deal with the emissaries. He doesn't know how these things work, palace goings and forth. But now he is sitting right by the throne and playing and watching. He has to be quiet. Although David, I, I, we're pretty sure, likes to talk by his personality in Scripture. This is a place you do not talk. And he watches as maybe an emissary comes from a foreign country and sees how Saul and them entreat with one another. He sees how the people come and go at the court. He is getting an education without knowing it about how to be king, how politics work, how people speak with one another and come and go. See, God, it's, it's a trite little saying that he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He is qualifying David. David doesn't even know it yet. But he's saying, you just play. You just play, but you're going to be learning without knowing it. Because if God has called you, and you say, I don't have anything to offer, you just be obedient. God will take care of the details. And yes, it will be scary. There's just no way around it. Some of you are afraid of public speaking. I'm obviously not afraid of public speaking. But after you make, um, you, you twist your tongue so many times, and you make a fool of yourself enough times, it just becomes kind of old hat. You're just kind of like, well, if I fall off the stage, people will laugh. So if nothing else, that's a bonus, right? I know I make some of you nervous when I stand here and I rock back and forth on the edge. And someday I'm going over. And if I do, you have my permission to laugh uproariously. Um, my wife will probably start it. So <laughs> um, unless my arm is bent in all kinds of weird shapes. But I also remember when I was a little kid growing up in church, I was terrified to greet new people. My, my dad, because he was a church planner, so we were in really small churches. There weren't other kids to say hi. He'd go, you need to go say hi to that kid. I'd go, Dad, I'm embarrassed. He'd be like, are you more embarrassed of meeting him or more afraid of me? And I was like, the embarrassment will last a minute. The punishment will last longer. And that's how I learned to step out of my shell. Okay, um, God, God begins to prepare you. God will prepare you. It doesn't mean it won't be scary. But God, if he is with us, then he can lead us to great heights. And we're going to see in just a minute, David knew this. David knew this. How else did God prepare David? He was also a shepherd. When he wasn't playing in court, he was out in the fields. David has a lot of quiet time. It's to be quiet in the court, quiet in the fields. So he goes out. And he's in solitude. Can you think about that? Wandering around with your sheep. And I'm sure David talked to the sheep and gave them little funny voices, talking back and forth. Fluffy, come over here. I will not come. I mean, maybe that's just me in our house. Uh, our animals all have voices, especially before we had children. Our dog would talk to us. And sometimes my dog, it was a puppy. It was only like a year old at the time. Lori would say, Beck, stop chewing on that. And he'd look, and he'd look at her and he would cast his voice into my mouth because he's a ventriloquist. And he would say, I will not! And she would be like, Beck, I'm serious. It's really funny. Sometimes you start to actually get mad at the dog for what the spouse is making the animal say. And, and then we got a cat. And the cat, we do not know why, but the cat has a British accent, not even a very good one. But I don't know what David's doing out there, but you know what? He's alone. So when he's not making a voices for the sheep, and by the way, I'm just reading in the scripture. That's way reading between the lines. Do not go home and say, I learned in scripture today that David gave voice to sheep. No, that is your, that is your pastor's crazy imagination running wild. But, David, but I hope you understand, David's a real person, stuck out on this hillside. But he's alone, and he has a heart towards God, and he has time to think about God. There's a real benefit of solitude. And now, by the way, some people really abuse this idea of solitude. Solitude is not... The goal. 
Being alone is not spiritual. But you know what? What I found out in our society is that sometimes, because we don't want to be, we don't want to be, solitude is not sacred, but rather we need to remove the distractions so we can think about God. Um, we, did, we just got back from camping. And you know what I love about camping? There's a lot of things I don't love about camping, including there being a bear on the loose when you have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. That's not fun, because um, I just think I look like a good little snack. <laughs> um, I also don't like mosquitoes. I don't like sleeping on the hard ground. But I love taking my boys out. There's no TV. There's no cell phones. There's no distractions. I can't play Angry Birds. Rather, they grab two sticks and they whack a stump for an hour and they, and they don't even ask for their toys because they're clearing away all the clutter. And sometimes we call it a quiet time, our devotional time, for a reason, we need to clear away the clutter. Think of, so many of you, right? You can't be quiet and still because then you're alone with your thoughts. Well, we're not supposed to be there like to empty our mind of thinking. Rather, we are to focus on God's word. And that's a great time to pull out the scriptures and start to read and say, you know what? I don't need to worry about the sports score or what's going on in Bangladesh on CNN. I can focus on what God has to say to me. I need to think about what he says. And David has a lot of time to think about God. And we know he does. We know he does. He's not emptying his mind, but he's removing the distractions to think of God and his revelation. And he's being prepared. And he's alone with God. He begins to have great thoughts of God. How do we know that? Because when we get to the next chapter, in chapter 17, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, he knows who God is. This is the Valley of Elah. It's, it's in modern Israel today. And this is the valley, if you don't know what the Valley of Elah is by title, that is where David fought Goliath. And see, the enemies of the Israelites at this time, the powerful enemies, the adversaries, are having lots of battles, are the Philistines. And they would go back and forth, and sometimes the Philistines would win, and sometimes the Israelites would win. And it was no accident that those were directly tied into Israel's ob obedience. However, at this time, with an ungodly king leading them, the Israelites are camped on one hill, and the Philistines are on another hill. And they're kind of doing a standoff. Same picture, just with the titles. Saul's on this hill. Philistines are on this hill. Big valley in the middle, where they're going to have a battle. Kind of curves around. Well, there's a little creek down there. Jesse says, David, take your brother some food. Bethlehem's not that far away, not with a donkey to travel. He says he brings them bread, some food. He's going to see them. But then he sees what has been going on all of chapter 17 up to this point, which is the Philistines have said, you know what, why do we all kill each other? You send your champion, we'll send our champion. They'll fight, and the loser will become the servants of the other. Problem with that is that Goliath is huge. Absolutely huge. We, we try to estimate it out because it's cubits, and there's two different sizes of cubits. He was six cubits in a span. Okay? Like, okay. These are measurements because not all of them had a, you know, standardized tape measures at that time. So your cubit is distance from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. On the average person, that's 18 inches. And there was another cubit in a different country. They made it like 16 inches. A span is the side of your hand. So you want to say, how tall is your son? Come here, Garrett, Matthew. Not very accurate, but it's pretty close, right? So you're like, this guy is like nine feet tall. Makes Shaq look like a dwarf. And he is in armor. He is a human wrecking machine. He is clothed. He's got a shield. He's got a spear. He walks out and says, I challenge you. And as the days go on, you can, you can picture how his mocking grows greater and his contempt for their God grows greater as they refuse to come off their hill and to engage the enemy. And as David walks in and he sees, just as, as Goliath is doing his annual call, saying, why have you come out here to line up for battle? This is verse 8 of chapter 17. Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. And in verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And Saul and all of Israel heard these words. They were dismayed. They were greatly afraid. Like they, Goliath's scary in a crowd. One on one. But David shows up and he's annoyed. He's like, are we not the people of God? 
Are, are we not the children of Israel who he's promised great things to? Why do we cower on this hill? And he's asking, he's like, who's going to fight this guy? He's, he's not that bad. He's like, God is with us. And his, and his brothers become, as you would imagine, pretty irritated pretty quick. Like, you're not even military trained. You haven't seen war. You know sheep. You need to go away. And they, and they start giving him a hard time. And then he's asking around. He's like, seriously, who's going to fight this guy? And some of the other soldiers here, and he's, he's like, what, what happens for the guy who fights this guy? I, I'll fight him. If, if you guys won't fight him, I'll fight him. David asking to fight Goliath. And word gets to Saul. He said, Saul, there's a guy willing to fight Goliath. And Saul, who's hiding in his tent, because really he should have been the one fighting, says, bring him here. And Saul apparently doesn't recognize that this is his harpist. And even if he does, he's like, um, I, I think of Hoosiers. And he's like, growing them kind of small on the farm these days, aren't they? You know, you can think about it, this teenage boy walking in and saying, um, you got a giant problem, I'm here to help. And Saul's like, <laughs> at first he's like, what? And secondly, he's like, wait, this saves me from getting my head removed. Sounds good. I can always find a new harpist. And he tries to put him in his armor. And David, because Saul's a tall man and David's a young man, and he's just wandering, he's like, there's no way I can fight in this. And he says, wait, wait a minute. When I was out in the wilderness and a wild animal came to attack my sheep, God was with me. And I had my sling. And the same God who protected me on the, in the wilderness with my sheep will protect me here. He says, so let me go out. And we read that early in the morning, Oh, excuse me, a little further down. It says, The Lord, by the way, in verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul, clo and we skip down, he said, I cannot walk with thee. So David took them off. Then he took the staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and his sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. What a, what a, what a situation where you go, oh, this is going to be over quick. And, and it was, just not the way people had anticipated. Because man looks on the outward appearance. On the outward appearance, this is no match. An untrained shepherd boy with a couple pieces of leather fastened together to make a pouch. A man who has been fighting since his youth, who is a mountain of a man, clothed in armor, valiant on the battlefield. If we look through the eyes of men, it is no contest. But if we could see as God sees, we also see it's no contest. It just gets flipped. But Saul is obviously not a godly man. In fact, he defies the God. And when he sees him, he disdained him. And in verse 43, he says, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. But David said to the Philistine, and this is where you know he was thinking about God. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give me into your hands. David may be young, and he may be still small. We don't even know if he's had his last growth spurt. But he knows who God is. And that is why God has chosen him. and is now on display. This is who I want to lead my people. A man who has faith and courage and conviction. And we know the story. The Philistine runs at him and David takes the sling and turns it and lets it fly. And the rock finds its home 
in the middle of his eyes. And it says it hits its forehead and sunk in. And he falls, the giant Goliath falls to the ground, dead. But just to be sure, and so everyone knew, David then goes over and takes the sword and removes his head as he said he would. And when the decapitated giant's head is held up for all to see, the Philistines lose heart. If their shepherd can fell our giant, we cannot compete with their God. And they run, and the great victory is won. And you see that David has a mighty, mighty victory. And David now suddenly has a name. Can you, overnight celebrity. You can imagine. Everyone goes home to their own villages and be like, the darndest thing I've ever seen. We're all scared. Standing up there, this little kid comes out. Don't even know where he's from. Has no armor. Stands right up to the giant and says, God is going to take you right now. And he lets a stone fly. The guy falls over dead and we win. You can imagine how the story just is just reverberating through all the countryside in Israel. After a while, you know, probably it's a good thing they, they record this right in the scripture. It's getting up to Dan in the north. And like, and so the shepherd boy came up and shot lasers out of his eyes and the entire Philistine camp burst into flames. But you understand, immediately they're like, who is this David? We have, we have a hero. We have a champion. And as time pro, as in the next time, Saul realizes he is a man of conviction and charisma and he starts to put him in charge of military endeavors. And God is with him, not because he is the most skilled, though God does give him ability. But he begins to win victories, and his popularity begins to grow. What God has now done for David is he has put him in a spot where now the people would accept him as a king. He has given him a platform. He said, I'm going to show them your heart and your conviction. I'm going to show them while I've chosen you. And they will now be drawn to you when they see what a leader you are and who you are. The people now know who David is. But what I want you to consider, it's not who David is in terms of his strength, in terms of his musical talent, in terms of his ability to give an impromptu speech that's really, really good. It's because he knows God. And Daniel says the people who know their God will take action. David took action. And David wanted to serve God with his whole being. Earlier in the book of Samuel, it was, it was actually spoken to Eli. But we see a verse. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Why is David so elevated? Because he honors God. He knows God. He wants God. I can't promise you that if we give our whole hearts to God, not just lip service, not just a few songs on a Sunday morning, not just a few coins we throw in a plate as it goes by, but our being, who we really are, if we give that to God, I can't promise you that your mortgage will always be paid on time. I can't promise you there'll be a new car or that all of Utah will suddenly come to Christ and they'll be like, wow, that sunrise is great. Look where Jesus worked. But I can tell you, that God will honor those who honor him. And maybe our rewards will not be seen until eternity. But that lasts a long time. And this world is passing. Saul was a man of fear who lacked conviction. He had all the tools, but he squandered them. David was a man whose only opportunity came because God thrust it upon him. But he knew where his strength came from. And God raised him up. And today, in looking at that, we can see what God can do through his people and with his people if they will honor him and obey him and follow with conviction. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for David's example and how you would put him in this drama so that we could see what following you looks like so that we could see your power displayed. God, I pray that you would give us the ability to see 
through spiritual eyes and not, not our own fleshly eyes where, where we get hung up on what we can't do and our limitations and, and miss out on who you are. But instead, give us a hunger for your word and a passion to know you, that by knowing you, we will take action. By knowing you, we will allow you to transform us into something that pleases you. And God, it is our prayer that you would use us in this time, in this place, for your glory and for the saving of many souls and the transformation of our lives to be honoring and holy before you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.